So I'm really excited that I'm going to interview Nav Vasudeva. For those of you who don't know, he was CISO at Dresna and Rothschild, and he is currently the founder of CISO International Limited and Cybercore. He's also one of my favourite people in the industry because he's so much fun. <laughs> so tell me something that I've missed out. What else have you done? Oh, wow. So um, apart from uh, my time in cybersecurity, I started off in coding mm -hmm. uh, very early on in my career. Uh, I hacked a bank when I was about 14. You hacked a bank? I did. A yeah. real one? A real one. Uh, um, did you steal any money? I did not, know. It was actually after uh, uh, watching a movie. Um, wow. <laughs> so so um, I don't know if you remember War Games. It was a really old yes. film. Uh, with, with I am Matthew younger Bush. than that. Uh, but 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 actually, they, they gave some pretty interesting tips away, and I, I took those and tested it myself, and realised that actually this is a really interesting, <laughs> <laughs> a really interesting career path for me to take. <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't know that. Yes, and 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 actually, I uh, at the beginning of my career, I thought I was going to be this you know really hot coder. Uh, but actually, it became a bit of a snooze fest, uh, and I got a bit bored of coding and, and started <laughs> to look at other things within the sort of security dynamics of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So what, if you were looking back on your career at the moment, what are you most proud of? Oh, that's a tricky one. I, I, I kind of think um, probably my time uh, at, a, at, a, at a retail bank that I, that I worked for, for for about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was going through sort of stagnant change. Uh, and, and I came in this very young, enthusiastic individual that, that thought I knew everything and, uh, you know, I had no real claim to fame to anything at that point in terms of things I had done. But I was charged to, to go and try and help make a difference in the way that they looked at information security and, 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 and cyber risk and start separating that, that sort of policy driven mechanism away from sort of the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was asked to, uh, as, as one of the first things I was asked to do was to write a position paper on what, where I thought the organisation was. Um, and I wrote a whole, no holds barred uh, <laughs> position paper, which inadvertently upset about 17 global heads of, of, of security at the time. I can imagine. But it started the debate and it started the right debate. And, and, and actually, I think, you know, one of the biggest achievements I think I, I did there was take them on a different journey and, 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 you know, for people that had been in their positions and the organisation for, for a long time, you know, 30 plus years, uh, I, I feel that was a, a great achievement on my part to get them to see cyber and, you know, information risk and, and so forth in, in, a, in a different light and tackle it in a different way. So building on that then, we hear a lot at the moment about how cyber risk is being taken more seriously. Do you think that the industry has changed significantly? Do you think that's true? I don't think it's changed that much, to be honest. Um, I think there's a lot of lip service to um, uh, ex sort of externally facing. You know, if, you, if you've got a large customer base, I think mm -hmm. it's important that, that, that people say the right things, but whether they're doing the right things is a different equation. Um, and it's a challenging one because if you look at the market split between sort of the SME versus the corporate world, yeah. uh, you know, SMEs don't generally have um, enough funding and, and, and budget and accessibility to advice guidance or even accessibility to technology. And in some cases, they don't actually need it. Yeah, you know, there, there are other ways that you can protect yourself if you're, you're a small business. I think large corporates are, are, are extremely complicated. Um, and in some cases, their, their, their sort of governance and oversight versus their technology footprint is, is not talking to each other. Um, uh, and I've seen it from organisation to organisation. It doesn't really change that much, you know. Uh, and I've headed a few <laughs> in financial services and beyond. And you've got the same politics, you've got the same stresses, you've got, you know, these, all these guys are suffering from the same risks. Um, the question is, how do, they, how do they take a practical and pragmatic approach to solving them? Uh, and throwing, in my view, technology at it doesn't, doesn't work. And also throwing money at a problem also doesn't work. You've got to just strip it back to, to what it is you're trying to protect. So what's important to you as an organisation? You know, what are your crown jewels? You know, 
um, what's going to have the most impact if you if you were breached and and have that thought process surrounded in in, in, in the right way then take practical steps to to measure how you're going to protect it you know put practical control mechanisms in you know look at your operational due diligence in a much more effective way but the most important thing you need to do is educate yeah without education it's just a pointless exercise and it has to be from top down you know follow follow the leader so to speak so are you seeing any of that buy-in from the top level down I, I think there's some a, a better appreciation for it now um, but also I think the way um, cyber security services are sold are extremely confusing um, uh, and as such I think there's got to be a, a conscious effort for us in the industry to start to demystify how complicated this is because it really isn't that complicated uh, but also get rid of some of the jargon you know mm -hmm. so that you know organizations can start to understand this and just easily you know bite-sized digestible things so you want them uh, 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 and, and and try to encourage them to to participate you know um, but again you know it's 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 a combination of you know service providers technologists you know analysts, you know, all coming together and collectively trying to solve this problem rather than, you know, disparately trying to do it in, you know, in, 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 in isolation. So what you end up with is a whole bunch of technology firms you know, developing a widget for this and a widget for that and, you know, a test for this, test for that. I think it confuses people out in the industry. So if you want to, you know, get these guys to buy in correctly, I think you have to, you have to simplify it for them. Yeah. So I know you're doing some very exciting things at the moment. Can you give us a little summary on what you're doing? Yeah, sure. I've set up a, a company called Cybercall, which is um, effectively looking at providing uh, advisory services to the SME market. So I, I realised this gap in, 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 in both the way that the, the small, uh, medium-sized enterprise and, and business market can attain good advice and also good technology when it comes to cybersecurity. But also they're so outpriced that it becomes impossible for them to be able to afford some of this. So we've, we've set up a virtual CISO service where we have access to individuals across the globe, um, um, around 100 virtual CISOs. And these guys have you know, 15 to 20 plus years experience in, in the industry. We, we've generated a, a sort of fixed price model. So that's very affordable for small businesses. Uh, and we run a subscription service, um, uh, and that gives them an end-to-end -end holistic level of support for for their cybersecurity requirements. So we want to take them on a journey, which helps you know manage their risks in the right way, helps them implement controls that are cost-effective based upon you know their risk exposure, and also from an operational due diligence perspective, if there's data protection or GDPR requirements and things like that, or if they're they're regulated by a particular body, you know we'll take them through that journey and again at a, at a, at a fixed price and you know we're on call to be able to support these guys in the right way. Brilliant. So what is your view on where the industry is going to go over the next 12 months? <laughs> um, well I think the threat landscape is always changing and, and, and that's the challenge that you know all of us in, 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 in cyber you know have to have to sort of deal with. Um, I think third-party risk is a, is a major issue at the moment. Uh, it's a number one prevalent you know, you know, persistent risk from a supply chain perspective. Yeah. Um, and we need to have better innovative solutions in, in trying to solve those problems. Um, uh, you know, we're still seeing m massive, you know, issues around, um, you know, malicious codes and, you know, malware and phishing. You know, these basic things are still, you know, impacting organizations and definitely impacting small businesses. Um, so again, I sort of circle back to the education piece. You know, we need to get better at educating, you know, the public. And, and I would say, you know, in partnership with, with government, that sort of private public sector partnership needs to be increased uh, and, and the visibility of that, you know, from a, from a national threat perspective. Yeah, so th I think they're, you know, they're very similar in nature to the things that we were seeing last year, but they're sort of just upscaling a little bit. And, you know, and we're still not solving some of those basic problems that lead to some of the more complicated ones here. And one of the key problems in the industry is getting enough talent into it. Are there any places, organisations, countries that you think are doing a great job? <laughs> um, I, th I think you know the, the, the talent equation has always been a, a, an interesting one. I think there's a lot of talent. Uh, I, I just think that the you know the, that the private sector has slightly you know put a 
it's a weird sort of scenario. You've, you've got a lot of people being educated, going into the public sector, coming out and, and demanding high salaries you know, in the private sector. You've got a lot of guys in the private sector that demand high salaries to do things. So I, I, I think there needs to be a sort of um, a, a balance out, you know, um, and we have to start at a very young age. We need to be teaching kids at school about cybersecurity. We need to be able to have more apprenticeships around cybersecurity. Um, you know, there's got to be better accessibility for the for, 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 for a talent pool that may not be touched by, you know, traditional methods of, you know, university and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of talent out there. The question is how do you harness it to, to, to you know, to, to develop in the right way. And then I don't think any one country or specific organisation has done it really well. Uh, I just think that we're collectively, again, as an industry, we probably need to come together and figure out the best way to, to sort of push that forward. Maybe we should start playing war games in school. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun, <laughs> for sure. Get some teenagers to hack some more banks. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a very different side to you. <laughs> well, you're going to hear some more in a minute anyway, so yeah. That's a... Well, thank you very much and good luck with your talk at the event this evening. Thank you so much. Thanks. Cheers. Mm -hmm.